Stone Blade uh, Twitch stream. Uh, we're really excited today. We have uh, Richard Garfield with us, and we have Justin. It's been a while, Justin. And we have, we're going to do some Q&A. We're going to hang out, uh, and we're going to just chat about Soulforge Fusion, about gaming in general. I'm sure there's lots of fun and interesting things that are going to come up, uh, and we'll see where the day sort of uh, the the day sort of takes us. Um, really excited about this. Hope you all in the chat are as well. Um, so definitely feel free to chat, uh, throw us uh, questions in the chat. I'm going to be watching the chat. Uh, we're going to be you know just kind of taking this uh, as it goes. You know, not a huge, uh, not not a certain uh, or specific plan here. Just sort of talking and and uh, interacting with you all. So, Justin, I said, uh, as I said earlier, it's been a while, I feel like, since we've had maybe your face on the stream. Uh, maybe your voice yeah. has been on the stream, but it's been a while since we've had your lovely face on the stream. How are you doing? And, uh, other than this, like, weird light that's shining in on my face, uh, I'm doing really <laughs> well. It's great, to, it's great to be back on the stream. I've been, uh, you know, long-time uh, follower watching you on the stream. It's good to be, you know, long-time listener, first-time caller. Uh, <laughs> yeah, your first time as my guest, really, because uh, since we've Just handed... No, no. no. <laughs> the, the light. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, so this uh, is kind of your first time as my guest, I would say, because we sort of handed off the baton to me. And now here you are. You're my guest, and that feels that feels good for me, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah. And then also we have Richard. Uh, Richard, welcome to the stream, and thanks for doing this, and thanks for being here. How are you doing today? Oh, uh, doing fine. Uh, uh, always fun to talk about games. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's been a blast uh, working on Soulforge Fusion with you, and uh, I think it should be a ton of fun getting into maybe the nitty gritty or getting into some of uh, the things that people are interested in hearing. Um, I know you've probably done this thing once or twice before, uh, so it should be a good time. Um, how's everybody doing in the chat? I'm starting to see some people. Hi, good morning, good morning. Hi, everybody. Yeah? Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, Justin, why don't you just kind of why don't you why don't you take over for a second here? And... Yeah, yeah, you know, it was it's it's obviously uh, you know it's great to be here. We've gotten a ton of questions that came in through our Kickstarter um, and through our mailing list. Uh, for anybody that's not uh, aware, Soulforge Fusion, the game that we have been working on, depending on how you count it now, for a decade uh, coming to life, uh, is live on Kickstarter. We have one week left. Uh, the campaign has been doing great, but we're looking to expand and bring in as many awesome people as possible uh, to make this really the next big thing in gaming. So if you're, uh, you can either search for us on Kickstarter or just stoneblade.com forward slash soulforge. Um, and anything you do, if you're already a backer, uh, we appreciate you and helping bring this vision to life. It's something that is uh, you know, brand new in the gaming space and builds on some cool work that Richard's done in the past that I've done in the past uh, and really trying to say something new. Uh, and anything that you can do to share and spread the word is really appreciated. So um, for everybody that's here, thanks for joining us. And everybody that's watching later, uh, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun, fun questions to get through. So, um, you know, while we're while we're getting started, Richard, I, I want to start with some let's just start with some non Soul Forge related questions, because I got a, I got some fun ones. Once people you know knew that you were going to be on here and we had a chance to just sort of tap, chat about games, um, there was a couple questions I found interesting, some that are going to be relatively uh common i'm sure you've gotten before but but the pedro canali was a former pro magic player he asked what's what's your favorite game right now other than soul Force fusion of course <laughs> uh, well the uh um digital game i'm playing the most is a uh, uh, storybook brawl uh, matt mm -hmm. places a uh, um excellent auto brawler uh yep. for paper games um uh you know i'm i'm uh, uh I've been, uh, oh, what was that one? Uh, oh, The Crew. The Crew uh, um, is a cooperative uh, uh, card game, uh, which uh, is very, it's a trick-taking game, a um, mm -hmm. uh, cooperative trick-taking game, which is uh, something uh, I don't think I've seen before, and it's uh, it's quite well done, and uh, um, uh, it's uh, 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 I think it won some awards, and uh, uh, it's been a lot of fun to play. Cool. I actually hadn't heard of that one. I played, uh, yeah, Storybook Brawl, and I've been, and I've, I've Matt plays a good friend also, and he's been on the Think Like Game Designer podcast, one of, one of our uh, great episode, really deep diving into Storybook Brawl and some of the other aspects beside that. But the crew, I'm going to have to check out. Um, so, uh, similarly, outside of the commercial success, taking that aside, this is from Alan Hockman, who's also been a longtime uh, magic coordinator, judge, running events. 
He said, outside of commercial success, what is your favorite game that you've created and why? I, know oh, this, uh, I, hate, I hate when I get this question, but I'm, I'm now I get to hand it off to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it is really uh, hard to separate. Uh, I mean, the commercial successes uh, uh, often uh, used as a limiter to uh, allow me to discard magic, but uh, um, it, it's it's hard to to drop magic as my uh, favorite. Uh, um, it was a really exciting time, uh, and it. Uh, it just uh, it was a, la a labor of love, and it just kept on being more flexible and uh, and uh, enduring than I expected. Yeah. Um, if you do uh, remove that from the from from uh, contention, and you remove uh, Soulforge Fusion, uh, 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 then then uh, I guess uh, uh, Keyforge would have to be next. Uh, although I really really like uh, Half Truth, uh, my trivia game with. Uh, um ken jennings uh but but uh keyforge uh has has unique decks and that was uh, uh a lot of fun like magic in a sort of similar way where it felt like we were exploring new spaces and uh i feel like uh with soulforge fusion uh, uh we've got to we, we we've uh gotten the chance to really uh explore it a lot further and uh and some new things were brought to the table yeah, that's. I think that's a great uh, a great transition here uh, because I think that you know I was just well well done. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think that um, it's you know the question is why make a game like Soulforge Fusion, right? Like, what is it that we're doing here, right? We took a game that we made, you know, ten years ago. We made the Soulforge digital game, which was designed to be purely a digital game, and we purposely made things that would be very hard to do in physical. And you've already made Keyforge, which is that has this unique deck aspect to it. And you already had Magic, of course, had all the customization and limitless possibility that started this whole genre and, of course, is my no-brainer answer for my favorite game. Yeah. Um, and so why, why Soulforge Fusion? What does that bring to the table here that didn't exist before or that builds upon all of this great work that, that you have done in the past? Well, uh, 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 I mean, I never, ever work on anything which uh is doesn't have something that's new to me even even games which look like they might not have anything new uh, there's something in there which interests me but soul Force fusion is just filled with them it's in this new area of sort of random deck games which uh i mean uh you had uh random deck play with trading card games for a long time with sealed deck play and and so forth but this idea of uh of of uh really making that the centerpiece rather than sort of this weird way people sometimes play uh, uh, just has a lot of possibilities. And with Soulforge Fusion, uh, this idea of, of, of bringing um, uh, uh, the choice of two decks with the smash up component of that, uh, I, I think just uh, it, it's like an exponential uh, 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 probably literally uh, a multiplier of the uh, of 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 the I interesting possibilities that you can get. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I love. I, I think I think it's really fascinating. And to me, and actually for for anybody that really is interested in deep diving this, so Richard, you you're the only person that's been on my Think Like Games on our podcast twice. Um, the last one was just, you know, we just posted right before the Kickstarter campaign, and it's really, you know, primarily focused on Soulforge Fusion. But the first one is a wide ranging topic of conversations, but if now people can re-listen to that and see how much I grilled you on Keyforge, how much I was curious about all of the details about Keyforge, because as soon as I learned about Keyforge, as soon as I saw that, I immediately was A, in love with the idea, right? This, this idea that everyone is playing a deck that's different because it really captures some of what was originally like, you know, exciting about magic, right? When I first started playing the game, that process of infinite discovery, that process of you never know what your opponent's going to have. And then as I, you know, became a pro player and started getting at the high levels and started reading all of the spoilers, right? The the, the magic kind of, you know, shrunk down to a, a more narrow piece. And, and Keyforge had the premise of, of, of really avoiding that and creating this, you know, limitless, uh, you know, variety and, and really exciting possibility. Um, yeah, and that, yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot of players I think who really uh, find the idea of uh, trading card games appealing for this uh, uh, for this quality uh, which they prompt which it promises and it does deliver to the casual player. But the more seriously you take it, the less it does deliver. This uh, the the limitlessness and the sort of uh, uh, yeah uh, uh, and and these sealed deck games uh, these uh, uh, random deck games uh, I, I think they do deliver. Um, 
and it, it and, and and it was a particularly good mechanic for this property because uh um this idea that uh because i mean it's clearly a good game uh, i mean we, we had lots of chances to play it digitally um but but uh but if you just make it a trading card game oh it'd be it'd be such a pain in the ass because you have to collect multiple copies of the same card so when you get the sealed deck uh, or the random deck uh delivery system we've got them all together and they you know you can uh, uh, brew in combos and things like that it's a it's really very good for this uh, game right right it helps to solve one of the core problems when we were trying to translate the digital version of soulforge into a physical game of soulforge fusion because it it takes three different cards to represent one card the level one the level two level three that's really at the heart of what like made soulforge magical and exciting the fact that you can level up cards you play that the cards can tell a story that we're able to balance the cards without any without anything like a casting cost but really based on how good they are at level one level two and level three and that uh, by being able to deliver the decks as half decks that come with everything you need, uh, it, it made that suddenly more, much more manageable. And, and then, you know, there was this idea of taking the, the concept of the one unique deck and splitting it into two, because I know when I played Keyforge, I really loved that variety, but I didn't feel the same sense of ownership and that little bit of customization. And it was playing, for me, it was playing games like Smash Up or even Magic's Jumpstart variant that really like mashed those things together for me. It was like, wow, okay, the, the, no, the amount that it changes psychologically and, and you know, sort of strategically and emotionally for I get one choice to customize as opposed to zero is really, it's, you know, we talked about it, it's exponential number of options, but it's really just, just kind of complete 180 as far as how it feels to own the deck and really feel like you've got agency there. Yeah, no, every, every uh, if you've got a half deck, uh, it just has a completely different character uh, depending on where you put it, and so so it's it's got yeah it's it's a it's a really uh, nice uh, level of customization. Uh, there's a there's a an inherent uh, tension in uh, random deck games in that uh, the more customization you give, the less the character of the original deck matters, and this this seems to be a really nice place to put it. For instance, in uh, keyboards, there's a lot of talk about making it a sideboard. But mm -hmm. but if you start adding a sideboard, then then you're going to get into this thing where everybody will say, oh, you've got to sideboard these things because they're garbage. And, and that that was one of the points is that a lot of these, quote, garbage cards are, uh, are they're a lot of fun to play or figure out how to use. And, uh, and if everybody sort of follows the same uh, pattern. But this, you know, this choosing two decks and uh, mix them yeah, it doesn't seem to uh, hurt that variety. Right. Yeah, and we we can. In fact, one of the you know we we I have a a long post. I'm I'm going to be putting up about some of our organized play plans. We've talked about them some. You know that we you know that ability to have you know sideboard a half deck potentially uh, is pretty interesting. And it, and because they're coming in different chunks, uh, you know you still are in that position where yeah you're going to have to play with the variety of things that you have and you have to make trade offs. It also helps, gives us tools. If there's a certain archetype that starts to become more dominant, we can have some, you know, sideboard in different ways to attack it. Um, so it does a lot of things for our for our organized play and metagame, uh, as well as just the fun of of hey, let's pick two decks and go. Yeah. So the, yeah. So the, there's a lot there. And then, I, you know, I'm gonna I use this to tangent into another uh, question. So uh, there was a couple questions about when is the digital client live and what's up with this being an online game and a physical game. And I want to, I want to, I'll start by addressing that one a little bit because it's, you know, we took an online game and we turned it to a physical game, but that's not all we did. We also created online functionality for that physical game. And so that could be very confusing. So I want to sort of clarify okay. it here, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a lot. It's, I believe me, I was just at Gen Con um, last week. <laughs> And I was pitching this game to people and selling, you know, sort of talking about it. And it was like, I realized how many innovations we had that we had to communicate. And as you and I have talked about before, Richard, uh, if you have too many innovations, it's actually a problem, right? Like, because it becomes harder for people to understand what's going on. So we have, we took the unique deck idea and then turned it into a, into, into split decks, so a hybrid deck game, as we call it. And we also allow you not only to, you can scan your decks with a QR code or, or using a unique alphanumeric code entered in to your online collection. And then we allow you to export that deck to play in Tabletop Simulator. So you can actually take your deck and play against somebody across the world. We can, we're can we going to run tournaments not just at local game stores, which is the main way we're envisioning it happening, but also in online communities, in Discord, in the areas where we can get together and play. And so it really, I think, you know, 
I, I've been enamored forever with this idea of creating good, true physical digital hybrid products, right? They're very hard to do well. I find most of them uh, tend to be kind of the worst of both worlds in a lot of ways. And here we're really trying to get something that's like, you know, it's a physical game first, but it also has an online game that you can play so that you still have more utility out of your decks and more opportunities to play. I think that um, one of the things that we're also going to be working with here. Oh, you know, okay. I've got a few other questions here. Come up in the um, in the chat, Gary. I haven't yeah. been paying attention. Yeah, if you want to serve us something yeah, the, there, the, and then I've got a couple questions I want to answer as well. But absolutely, yeah. I didn't want to interrupt because uh, it was super. That was a really fun little segment. You guys were just going back and forth there. Fun to listen to. Um, we did have one question that kind of harkens back to where we were at the start, sort of. Um, and it's, uh, what, uh, what is your favorite game that you created and is no longer in print? And I think both of you maybe can answer, answer this question. But maybe we'll start with you, Richard. A game, we uh, can't, a game of yours we can't get anymore, but you really, you really have a fondness for. Oh, sure. Uh, um, I will go... I, I don't know if you can get this, uh, but it's not being printed anymore. So, and you, you probably you probably can't, or you probably have some difficulty. Uh, but Spynet uh, um, is a game I, I really like, and uh, um, I'm actually uh, just working with a Korean publisher to try to get out another version of it. Um, but uh, but uh, uh, it 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 I, it. it really surprises me that it didn't get more traction because it's a uh, uh, one of my favorite two player games and it plays really well teams of two um and so yeah uh with that there cool cool justin anything I, come to mind for you uh yeah for me 100 it's the world of warcraft miniatures game uh i i i loved working on that game i loved bringing it to life i you know kind of innovated some new things in the space that i really you know i, I Obviously, trading card games are, you know, where I spent most of my time playing and, and the thing I, for sure I spent the most of the time on. But I used to be a huge miniatures game player back in the day and, uh, you know, playing Warhammer 40K and Heroclix and all stuff like that. And so being able to build a miniatures game with, like, cool World, World of Warcraft characters and the kind of trading card game sensibilities was something I really, really loved. Uh, and, you know, that game's been out of print for some time. Uh, which why it was fun to be able to come back. I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get that license to bring it back, but I was able to bring some of those lessons to the Ascension Tactics uh, miniatures game that we did a Kickstarter for last year, and I was able to finally get in my hands for the first time last week. So, oh yes, uh, that was yeah. it. That was very exciting. Yes, we uh, us on miniature the games. Go miniature ahead. games take up so much space uh, and uh, uh, and uh, setup time. So uh, I think we should do a digital miniatures game. I think that would yeah. be fun. Yeah. Yeah, that is a really good idea. Okay, next project. And then, you heard and it then here we first. can make a paper version of it. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And then we'll make a tabletop simulator mod just to kind of split the difference yeah. there, and it'll yeah. all work out. Great. Yeah, us, us on the team definitely had, uh, you know, we had to we had to listen a lot to Justin telling us about all the lessons from World of Warcraft miniatures while we were working through Ascension Tactics. I feel like we all got, you know, our own taste. It's almost like I made the game too. But yeah. uh <laughs> basically the same thing basically the same yeah thing. exactly uh, <laughs> um i will point out that anybody that wants to can play ascension tactics on tabletop simulator for free right now uh and it it'll actually be in stores at the end of the year yep but, come come yeah. come see our discord uh there there are still instructions on how to get um you know an, a, a version of uh tactics on tabletop simulator it's fun yeah and we could probably put a link to our discord in the in the chat here if we uh, uh so anybody that doesn't know already that that's where we're hanging out and having a good uh, you should you should come join us there because whether you're interested in Soul Forge or Ascension or any other things, uh, even just learning about game design, we talk about all that stuff here. Um, cool. So I think uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna transition to another category of question that I received, which is kind of the a little bit of understanding around why we made changes to the Soul Forge game. Right? There were a lot of people that loved the Soul Forge game as it existed. Uh, you know, in the digital form. And we made, we kept the, a lot of the heart of it the same. It's still lane-based combat. You're still trying to knock your opponent's health down to zero. Uh, the card's leveling as you go, recycling through your deck. But we made a few changes as we, you know, morphed this into a physical game and from lessons learned. And and I think some questions for, for Richard and I came in. There's like, why well, do this, right? So, so w the first question I got was from Andrew William. That was, uh, what was the motivation for moving to sudden death after level four? 
um, and that the um, you know original Soul Forge didn't have that mechanism. So after you, and just to clarify, every time you shuffle your deck, your your player your your Forgeborn levels up, gets a new power, um, and then after level four, which is his highest power, if you go through your deck at the end of that, then whoever has the highest life total wins. The game ends at that point. Um, and so uh, the question is, why why do we do that? And so I have my own answer for it, but I'm gonna let, I'll let Richard uh, kind of kick it off here, and we can back and forth a little bit. Well. Uh... Um, when you're trying to control the time in a, a paper game, it's a lot harder than on a digital game. A digital game, you you can have a timer going uh, that's set to whatever the community wants it set at. Uh, you can even have a variety of settings. Um, but uh, uh, but when you're face to face, uh, you know, games sort of. Uh, it's nice to have some control on the length of the game, but still capture the uh, the essence of the play, uh, because it allows you to 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 like set, have an evening with a with a league or uh, playing tournaments where where the things end in a timely fashion. You can even put timers on them, and uh, and it'll work out. Yeah, yeah, I think that was one of the major motivations to ensure we can have things fit in, in, in a good time structure, both for casually playing at home, you know, you're not going to go playing forever, as well as to make tournaments end in a reasonable period of time. Um, and also there was some more like gameplay function, the way things um, played out, right? Every, when you're going through your deck the first time, every time you play a level one card, you're filling in with a level two card. When you go through your deck the second time, every time you play a level two card, you're filling it with a level three card. So your deck stays at exactly 20 cards every time. Uh, and then once you get to level three, we have when you start playing level three cards, they actually don't level up anymore. They actually leave the deck uh, at that point. And this is something that we debated quite a while of whether that's how it should play or not. Um, we decided it was the best for gameplay. But that means that after your fourth time through your deck, uh, there's this possibility that you could start thinning your deck out of all your cool cards. And so the game actually starts and goes to this crescendo. And then after that, it would start to become less exciting. Um, and so it actually, I think, was a good place to end the game uh, and keep things, you know, exciting all the way through. And if you're able to keep more of your level threes, or if you're you get a you don't draw as many level threes in your third cycle through your deck, and you can make it to the fourth cycle, you're going to be way advantaged to be able to take advantage of that. So it created some some interesting balance there. Yeah. So that that I mean that begs another question uh, with the uh, with um, uh, the digital Soulforge, uh, the level threes stayed level three. Is that right? right? That's right. Yes, that's yeah, correct. Yeah. So, so that would uh, beg the question: Why did we make it so that they go away? Right. And, uh, yeah. And, and and yeah, and and uh, we did, talk, as as uh, Justin say, uh, uh, debate that some, but uh, it just felt like uh, it felt like it was a more interesting game state when you defeated something that was scary for it to be removed from contention. Uh, yep. Certainly, that was the reason that uh, that I leaned that direction. Yep. The yeah. reason of, yeah, the feeling of relief when you get rid of that level three dragon and not have to just kind of see it, you know, deja vu, deja vu, just have this thing kind of be coming at you forever. But the, there's the other element too, which was just the sequence of play, you know, when a creature, anything other than a level three, a creature that is destroyed or dies goes to the banish pile. And we didn't want this kind of two, you know, this, you know, what sometimes they go to the banish pile when they're level one and two, and sometimes at level three, they go to your discard pile, right? Right. And kind right. of mess that's, that's with people's just, right. order of operations and stuff like that. Right, right. Training because because you know, let's be honest. Like the hardest part about Soul Force Fusion is, is is getting used to that pattern of like leveling up the cards and knowing when to put things from your upgrade pile into your deck. And I, it was great also for me and very validating to be able to do this at, at Gen Con. And I had I demoed dozens of times to people. And those first couple turns, it, you don't for, don't remember it, but once you've been trained, once you play, go through that first cycle through the deck, people will remember and they get the pattern right but i didn't want to break that pattern and now change it oh yeah i gotta remember now the cards that are in play have to come back and cycle in and back into your deck and then there was a third reason as well which was um it creates a very bizarre incentive structure because if you're at the end of your deck cycle and you have a level three creature in play your opponent might actually be advantaged not to kill it mm -hmm. until after you shuffle because if, it, if killing it puts it back into the deck then you're 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 facing the threat of it coming back in when that just felt like a really awkward Incentive, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, you yeah, want yeah. you want to feel good for killing your opponent's creatures, not feel stupid for doing so. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of reasons that made that decision right, and then that decision then cascaded into also why we want to make sure we have another advantage to having sudden death, and again having the Forgeborn level up to level four, um, which was also something maybe it's worth tangenting into that. Right, we changed for the way Forgeborn work in in original Soul Forge, 
Forge World were our, where they were our iconic characters, and they but and they they leveled up to level four. They were the only cards that did that, but uh, they often wouldn't come into play as much, right? Because level four, you don't see your level four cards all that often, and so even though these Forge World were super cool and there was a dream to live there, um, they didn't really become as central to the game. And so in Soul Forge Fusion, we made them really central to the to the whole game, right? You have one that starts in play and that gains powers as it goes up in level. Uh, maybe Richard, you want to talk a little bit about about that change and what it does for the game. Yeah, uh, uh, taking taking uh, these element this element of the game and making it into basically a sort of a meta characteristic of your deck, uh, 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 you know, adds a lot of character to the deck because these these things, the Forgeborn, is always there and always affecting things. It's not like a regular card where you might not, might not draw draw it. Uh, and it might not be impactful. The Forgeborn uh, affects this whole meta structure of the game, and and that's really important in a game like uh, Soul Forge because you re because the uh, the lifespan of stuff in play is not uh, great, and so making long lasting effects is is something which you've got to do through repetition of cards coming up because when you put in a level one, it sets up the long term uh, action of future cards. Uh, but uh, things that are in play having an effect, they tend to go away. But the Forgeborn is sort of this glue that holds it all together. And so having something there that uh, 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 powers up with your deck and uh, and adds a character to it across uh, from game to game uh, across the different levels is uh, terrific. And uh, and having that be the Forgeborn is, is a, a natural solution. Yeah, yeah, I know, uh, it, Richard, you've been very good about kind of beating that drum, making sure that we have, you know, items to combo with, items to kind of create those synergies, and the, the Forgeborn are, they, they do, they give you that sense of permanence. I know for sure at level two, you know, when I, at level two for my deck, I'm going to have three opportunities to pair, do something cool with this Forgeborn, and at level three, I'm going to have three opportunities at that, and so you can really plan around it and build around it, and and it was also our most fun opportunity to really play with our procedurally generated cards and algorithms, right? Like not only- Most fun so far. Yeah, yeah, uh, good point. We are working on set two secrets, but uh, um, it was really great to, you know, not just create the decks procedurally, create the decks with our algorithm, but also to create the cards with our algorithm. And so with with uh, many of the cards in the game, you, it, you know, they create these sort of two halves of the card, what we, you know, kind of the noun and the, and the, and the adjective. So you might have, you know, an, an armored, Yeti and a hibernating druid, or you could have a hibernating Yeti and an armor druid, and the number of permutations there creates a lot of interesting things. But with the Forgeborn, we actually have those three different powers that they have on them, and we were able to pick from a variety of different uh, possible powers at each tier. Uh, and actually, this is a really another maybe it's another worth, thing worth riffing on a little bit because there was a lot that went into when we first made the Forgeborn, we kind of had them. You know, their powers were kind of a little bit all over the place. We had a series of ones to pick from for two and from three. And I think you really helped to bring them to life in a way that was really powerful, Richard. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what the thinking was about how we did that algorithm and how we built those powers. Yeah. Uh, um, when I was making Forgeborns, I, I found it really difficult at first. But then we began to – what what happens is uh, uh, I, think, I think the uh, um, key idea was uh, put forth by SCAF. Uh, but, uh, but, but, uh, what we ended up going with was, uh, instead of just, uh, drawing powers from a bag for each, uh, Forgeborn, we had, um, uh, certain tiers of power. For instance, you might have something which gives you a, uh, resurrection power and it would be, uh, a, a, a small effect at the level one, a medium effect at level two, a big effect at level three, as they're supposed to be. And, uh, but it would be a resurrect type power. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, um, but then instead of giving, uh, the Forgeborn three of those, what you would do, would, uh, uh, take, uh, this Forgeborn would be defined by their resurrect powers, their whatever, uh, uh, uh destroy powers and their, you know, buff, uh, little creatures powers and uh, you know something else you choose uh, three of these four you take a, a level of each and then you sort of bung them together and this control uh, gave them a lot more character uh, and it became they became a lot easier to design and and it's a, a really an illustration of this uh, um, ongoing uh, uh, challenge with with uh, procedurally generated and random deck games which is that uh, um, if 
you have unbounded uh, uh, variety that ha that doesn't have much character. Uh, if you but but the restraint you put to that variety begins to make it so you've got character. So 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 in uh, in keyforge that's why you've got the houses here. The the factions play that role, but then within the factions we also have you know patterns set up like particular cards tend to call other cards, and that gives character to the whole thing. And the and the forgeborns after this change. Uh, began to have that sort of character where you'd look at them and you sort of, they weren't just a, a mixed bag of craziness, they they had character. Yeah, yeah, and that's really important for people to be able to relate to them and have your favorite Forgeborn, the character or identity. And it's also something we're going to play with as we go through um, the storylines of of the world of Soulforge, that these characters will evolve and that your uh, performance in certain tournaments will have storyline tournaments where players, if you the Forgeborn you use, if you win a tournament with that Forgeborn, it's going to have an influence in the world. And those Forgeborn will rise or fall based on how well they're doing uh, and different choices people make in the storyline. So I think there's something that making them really come to life and have an identity, even though my Forgeborn is likely to be very different than yours in, in the exact construction of its powers, is something that's like, I think I'm really proud of that we were able to make work uh, as well as we did. And, and it creates for a lot of fun variety. Yeah. Yeah, you know, character and variety are odds of one, one another. If you have infinite variety, you've got no character. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, okay. I didn't mean to jump in there. Yeah, I, I remember that specific, uh, you know, design meeting, and we had, you know, th these amazing, like, the, the the variety was amazing with all these Forgeborn, right? We had so many different buckets and different things that you could, and every Forgeborn was just really the variety was just really it was really there but it felt like hodgepodgey and when yeah. um when when scaff pitched this idea of you know well what if they only had this many abilities but they each were kind of similar and leveled up and i remember it yeah. took it took me and maybe justin a little while we're like wait what are you saying exactly and we kind of walked through it and then it finally clicked and then it just kind of all made sense it's like okay no there's still going to be great variety we can name these abilities. You'll see them repeatedly. You'll get some familiarity with them, but the variety will still be pretty dramatic because you have three different versions of all these powers. They're all slightly different, and you have them in different sequences. You have them in different combinations with one another, and it really was that kind of turning point um, that was really a fun moment, one of those fun moments in kind of like group design where it just all clicks and everybody's on the same page, um, and that was, yeah. yeah, that was definitely a really fun it, uh, Yeah, I remember it took... It took me a little, a little bit to, uh, I mean, because the uh, amount of variety you get works really well, but it's way less than we had. Yeah, right? yeah. it's got this, and 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 it took me a, a little while to appreciate that. Uh, yeah, that was a good trade-off. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and 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 also to, to to set the bar because you still got a lot of flexibility where you can put it. You can give them. Uh, um, three abilities to draw from but then they'll always have the same three abilities mm -hmm. that's you know sort of even more consistent character uh four abilities which i think is what we settled on uh and you choose three of those four still pretty consistent and you can keep on adding them and then it sort of gets you know sort of tails off into this chaotic yeah, space right. uh but yeah but, uh, it was nice yeah, it felt like we had some control yeah yeah this is the heart of like the game design process right for people that are out there like that that iteration that that we're trying to balance conflicting goals here, right? This in this case, character versus variety, and trying to figure out, okay, where does it feel right? How do you get trade-offs that maximize both items, and and where does it feel right once you're kind of playing with it? Uh, and yeah, it's a it's just it's a it's a lot of work, but then when those moments come together where you're able to get that right connection and and kind of win on both levels is always like is always very exciting. Uh, and then, yeah, good. So we're giving credit to, to to Scaff here, who's not part of this uh, stream because he's not as uh, as excited about being on them. But he is a <laughs> he is a he is a powerhouse uh, that that has, is as much responsible for a lot of the stuff as anybody here. Um, we do have uh, an interesting question. I don't know. I, I can probably speak to it, and either of you can jump in uh, too. It's a question about the you know the tabletop simulator version. Sure is awesome, but have you played? you know, physically, and what's that like, and does that make the game take longer? Um, and uh, and I, we've had, a, like, a lot of interesting experiences. We've had a lot of di interesting tests that we've done. And 
really surprisingly, there is not a ton of difference in the total time. Uh, the, the sneaky part about Tabletop Simulator that you don't think you're going to gain a bunch of time in physical form is moving cards on the table and setting the health counters. In Tabletop Simulator, it's incredibly clunky. In physical space, it's very fast. And that actually is a ton of the processing and kind of the maintenance time. Um, and then the, the part where you think, oh, you're going to gain all of this extra time with Tabletop Simulator is searching through for your leveled cards. But that's kind of parallel processing a lot of the time, right? You play your card, it's your opponent's turn, you're searching for your card. It's a little bit more work. But you find that card usually before it's your turn again, so it actually doesn't really add any time. And then really yeah. you just got the shuffling left at the end, which it's a 20-card deck. It doesn't take incredibly long to shuffle. So we've actually found it's pretty... It's it, shockingly to us, we were like, oh no, you know, it's going, it, the games are in a good spot lengthwise on Tabletop Simulator, but surely that's going to increase when we play physically, and it just hasn't turned out to be the case, which has been really interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure where where I would have bet there, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I am very sensitive to this idea that no matter how good you are, Tabletop Simulator adds this tax to your play. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and and so it's pretty amazing uh, that you got it down to uh, being the same as, as, as paper. Mm -hmm. Most games, you know, it's like even yep. if people know what they're doing are, you know, 20% longer or something like that, just right yep. off the bat on Tabletop yeah. Simulator. Yeah, I want to give a shout out to Shadow here who has built our custom tabletop simulator mod, which is really magical how much it does. I mean, it does it levels the cards automatically for you. It shuffles the deck automatically for you. It has like a lot of things. It got you know has all the tokens that are easy to mod, you know, easier to modify than than they were by default. Uh, it's it's a lot really things. good. Yeah, it's yep. it's I mean it's it's a lot of things that make it feel fun. It's not it. You know, it's not a full custom client for the game, which is definitely something we would love to do back again in the long term. But it is, uh, it is a really powerful tool. And and I think, yeah, I think just to, to to piggyback off Gary's comment, I think every one of us had that same fear about the physical shuffling and, and setting things up. And every one of us had this like amazing sense of relief once we finally played it. Right? It was first it was Gary and I playing in physical space and like saying, yes, this actually works. And then Richard and I, <laughs> we got to play it. And then I've now gotten to do it with yeah. tons of people, both at, at, at Gen Con and at uh, Mox uh, Boarding House when we were in Portland and a bunch of places. So it's, it really does. Yeah. Uh, does flow very well. Yeah, I'll also yeah. I'll also say when we play when we got together to play Justin, we had been remote for so long, and you know we had all these processes for being safe and all this kind of stuff. And we played in person and had I had cards in my hand again, and it was actually the moment in the in the, all of the you know last year and a half or so where I it really it stood out to me saying like. Oh, tabletop gaming, in-person gaming is not going anywhere. I'm so happy to have these cards back in my hand. And I, I, it always sticks out in my mind is like that game of Soulforge. Not only did we validate that this is okay, this is actually great in person, more, way more so than we were kind of fearing early on, right? But it was just like, yeah. oh, and, and people, the tabletop simulator is great, but there's going to be a desire and just a real gratitude when we can all get back together and, you know, start playing more and more in physical space. Having those cards in your hand is just, there's nothing like it. Yeah. Yeah. We've had to adapt to the pandemic. Obviously, you know, we've, we, we, that's a big part of the reason why we started playing in place and our team is now a hundred percent remote and obviously it, but it, it's opened up the doors for us to work much more closely with Richard and with other, you know, our play testers and people that are in our discord. Uh, but there's just no substitute for good old tabletop gaming. And that's why I'm so excited to bring soul forge, uh, to, to tabletop with soul forge fusion. Um, there are some questions. So oh. I, yeah, go ahead. Oh, you want, sorry, you want to hit, I, with a, hit me with a question there. Yep. I've got I've got one I've got one that was set in. I'll, I'll you uh, chat. Um, so uh, this was sort of going down the list of changes that we made to the game uh, from Soul Forge to Soul Forge Fusion and, and why and how we built it. So one of the things Soul Forge used to be that you uh, I took a turn and I could play two cards and and attack in any order, and then you would do the same and we would go back and forth. And we moved it to a shared turn structure uh, where I play a card, you play a card, I play a card, you play a card, then we have combat and kind of lock that down a little bit. And the question was, why did we go, why did we do it that way? Um, what, what were the advantages of changing it over? And so, um, Richard, if you want, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you kick that off because you actually had a, a significant influence on simplifying that system from what we handed off to you at first. I, for, I forget, how was it at first? We originally allowed you to take it. I think we did. We had a we had a pre combat main phase kind of and a post combat oh. main phase, and you could up to play 
two cars before right. or after, and like we're trying to mimic what Soulforge was originally a little bit yeah, more. It's kind of closely. a pass, pass, pass sort of thing. So if you t had actions to take, you could sort of send action back to your opponent, and you had these two kind of more f open ended phases for card playing and action taking before and after the combat. Yeah. Um uh, uh, getting those into a more controlled uh, framework was really good for paper. Uh, we just uh, there's 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 so much challenge that's introduced by the idea of leveling up everything uh, and sort of uh, managing these decks, which I think has been managed really well. I've had the same experience everybody has with uh, you know playing it uh, uh, face to face. Fear, oh, this is this is pretty good. This works, but but. Um, uh, yeah, ma making it so that uh, so that we're that we don't have uh, that 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 everybody knows uh, th that the steps are much uh, uh, more understandable by players and uh, and 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 follow this uh, this sort of uh, fast pace um, uh, uh, seemed seemed to be the right way to go with a game like this. Yeah, that one that playing one card um, and then passing gives you much cleaner time to be like, okay, I'm gonna go level that card. My opponent's taking their starting their turn and that more you know controlled turn structure just helps remove every barrier that was going to get in the way of you know the gameplay itself is much easier and simpler than a lot of you know trading card games and things out there and this this variety and strategy comes from the leveling process comes from the fact that you're making you know one decision out of five or two you know two plays out of five over the course of the turn uh really really creates creates a lot of, of variety and a lot of really interesting decision making just even just in that limited structure that they, they didn't need the extra variety it didn't need the extra like post combat plays uh, and and I think that yeah. was it's another good example of like where I know for me you know I was my thinking was was you know kind of tunnel vision because I was so thinking about just recreating what was there before and I think um, that you really helped to shake that up and, and and really analyze anew like what's best for this as a physical game as opposed to what was the digital game yeah, well, and certainly that's the the right place to start, right? We we uh, and which which uh, uh, we've done well, which is uh, I think we've done a good job at that. Where you 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 use what we had, which worked quite well, uh, and the changes weren't so much about fixing anything that was wrong with the original, which we loved. It, they were about adapting to this uh, new medium, and uh, sometimes the differences were subtle. Yeah, it's uh, this is also a, a, one of my favorite recent examples from work that when people uh, an often th uh, something that people bring up often is you know oh you know what are the differences between physical and digital design right and this is a great example of actually there are some times where you have to restrict yourself in digital design right there's there's tech limitations but then the the design process as well in Soulforge we were very focused on having asynchronous turns because the 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 kind of back and forth and holding priorities and all this kind of stuff you know games after us have figured out better and better ways of doing this but at the time we were you know sort of blazing new trails and we really thought asynchronous is where it's at you know like you got to take your turn and just be done with it um and that's not the case in a physical game right having this back and forth having this kind of like all this kind of stuff you know all these versions had a little bit of the back and forth but i think it's just uh, you know off to the side is this kind of cool concept of we could break away a little bit from old soul forge in a number of different ways because actually the physical physical medium opens up new possibilities over digital which i think a lot of people uh you know don't realize sometimes yeah no the the uh, uh those lessons are really large in my head uh, because of uh, experiences with magic uh, in particular, trying to digitize that was just a nightmare uh, because of its uh, timing structure. And it wasn't, of course, designed for digital. And uh, um, so a lot of games have done, uh, you know, started to find a really good place uh, online, you know, with Hearthstone, for example, where where there is no you know, nothing you do during your opponent's turn. And a return allows us to lighten up on that. But at the same time, uh, a lot of people, I think, don't appreciate how much interaction there really is, even in a even in a fire and forget game where you can't do anything during your opponent's turn. That is most clearly illustrated when it's this back and forth, because I play something and you react to that, and I react to that, um, and uh, it may not be a counterspell type reaction, although. When get those sort of things in is good uh but uh but it you know it effectively ends up being the same thing 
Yeah, and Soul Forge Fusion makes that abundantly clear. I mean, like, because you're playing a creature into a, and then the opponent how it can either play a creature right across from it and really direct mash up, or can opt to play somewhere else and try to make their own offense. And so it feels very interactive, uh, yep. even though there's no there's no counter spells or anything like that in the game. Like when your opponent has priority, they have priority. But it's that because of that back, I play, you play. It really does feel very interactive. And and frankly, it's it's maybe one of the most you know interactive games in this I've I've worked on in the sense that like everything I you know paying attention to what my opponent's leveling has a huge impact on what I'm going to level and whether or not I want to be playing for early game versus late game and the different types of card matchups that are there like it is intensely you know strategic and interactive at 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 deeper and deeper levels right on a surface level you can clearly see that okay do I play my creature across from you how does it match up and at a deeper level I can really you know think about what everything that you're playing and how it's going to impact the game over levels one two three and and beyond yep uh, one, one of the uh, um, acid tests uh, which I, I'm using more and more these days which uh, I, I've talked a lot about uh, uh, with the design is 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 um, if if I can see your hand, will I play differently? And and uh, uh, and and so it's not about whether I can do something against you. Uh, you know, uh, when you do something, can I undo it? Uh, to me, the most important question is: if I could see your hand, would I make a different play, or would that affect my play? And that's it's surprising how constantly that's uh, an issue in in uh, in in uh, soul forge fusion where uh, you know I'll make plays because I'm setting up the second play and my opponent will make a play uh, to react to that and then either my combo works off or it doesn't depending on whether they blocked it if they could have seen my hand they would have been able to respond to it much more effectively mm -hmm. I think that fills a real good space that the that you might miss on something w uh, with a direct counter spell yeah, more subtle, but uh, but doing exactly the same sort of thing. Yeah, and it's a great heuristic for for anybody that's you know working on a game like this with hidden information. Right? If if I knew the information that you had, would that make my play different? And if the answer is no, uh, most of the time, then you you know something's wrong with your game. <laughs> um, all right, we'd only have I think like ten minutes or so left, so I want to make sure we get to more questions from the chat. Um, I got most of the ones that were submitted beforehand, but uh, I, Gary, do you got anything uh, you want to surface for us? Yeah, you know, there's there's a handful here and there. I think we've touched on bits of some of them already, just naturally. Um, there's a, a specific question in here uh, that was I was uh, I was curious if Spectromancer influenced the design of Soulforge at all from Cardboard Gamer. Uh, I don't know. That was so long ago. I mean, it's a <laughs> lane based. Uh, yep. uh, um, uh, and uh, the first time I ever saw lane based combat that was so uh, that was that was that controlled was uh, a predecessor to Spectromancer Astral Tournament. Uh, and Spectromancer uh, was a game I did in partnership with the designer of Astral Tournament. Yep. Um, and I'm really not sure what the long reaching uh, influence of that game is, but it might be of, of, of Astral Tournament is, but uh, but it could be. It certainly, you know, being the first uh, doesn't necessarily mean you're the, uh, you know, the influencer. It's a natural enough idea, I think, that uh, that uh, it could easily have evolved uh, independently. Uh, I, I do remember specifically uh, many people on our team were playing in the very early days of Soulforge kind of concept. And, you know, we were working with you, Richard, but it was still is kind of like that tennis, you know, you, you give us some thoughts, we take it, we kind of run with it. And Spectrum, uh, Spectromancer is a game that we played a fair amount. And I remember being kind of sucked into that game for a, like a good little solid amount of time, just always playing it. Uh, and uh, so I, I would say... Uh, whether you thought so or not, I, I think it would be impossible for it to not have at least influenced us in some regards, because I, I remember at least three or four of us on the team were, were playing the game, uh, you know, a decent amount right at the beginning there. That just brought the memory back. I hadn't thought about it in forever, yeah. actually. That's really funny. Well, well yeah, and it's really interesting to me, like, when I think about, like, why I was in favor of lane-based combat for Soulforge, it was, it was, again, because of the medium, right? I wanted to make sure that there was a restricted number of spaces in the board so I could play it on my phone. Right, you don't like things where magic, where you can have you know fifty creatures in play, is just like not very functional in that space. And so I wanted something that restricted uh, the number of things I could have in play. 
uh, at the time. And it ended up leading to all of these really interesting ramifications. And I really enjoyed what the, the play of it meant. Um, um, but we did consider, you know, for a while, whether or not we wanted lane based combat or not. And we also even looked at that potentially removing it when we went into the physical space, um, as well. Cause mm -hmm. in my mind, lane based combat sort of necessitates sticky damage. Right. And I mean, you know, we can we can discuss this, potentially, but the idea that, like, if you have a giant creature in a lane, I need to have some ways to deal with it, and interact with it, even if I don't have a creature of appropriate size. And so tracking damage is probably the most, you know, com it's a really the most cumbersome part of the in play elements. Um, but we felt like it gave us enough value to be really worth it. Yeah. Um Sorry, I don't want to move on too quickly, but we have limited time, and uh, we just had No Lux Given highlight one of their questions that I was I was having in the queue here, which was, uh, we've talked about it a little bit, Justin, in the past, but uh, it's the he is uh, they are curious on uh, the thoughts of balancing decks somewhat. Is there a range where you encourage players to keep chasing powerful decks? Uh, you know, are, are there going to be uh, limited to rarities? Is there going to be some sort of lock system or some sort of you know? In, you know, in ingrained in our system, balancing. Wait, did you mechanism. say lock system or luck system? Lock system. Uh, it's referencing. I, I'm I'm throwing that in there. You know, the the lock system of Keyforge. How, how do I think how do, chains? I think chains. Oh, oh, chains. Sorry, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, locks are a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> handicap system. Yes, handicap yeah, system yeah. is a better way of just saying it. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot going on. There's a lot to unpack here. So it's a good yep. question to surface. It will probably take the remainder of our time uh, because there's a lot of things that we put a lot of thought into this. Um, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off and then we can kind of bounce it around. That's right? a whole you hour know. of talk right there. Uh, right, exactly. And, and I, actually, I actually do encourage you to, A, listen to the podcast that Richard and I did on Think Like a Game Designer. We talk about this a fair amount. I also uh, wrote an article all about this in, uh, on my website, uh, justingary.com, which goes into it in detail. Uh, so, so there's there's a ton of content, but we'll touch on it at a high level. Um, so, a couple of things that we've done here. One, uh, as a lesson that Richard learned from Keyforge, we took where we we don't give you quite as much open endedness as Keyforge did at first, um, because we want to make sure that decks all kind of make sense together, right? Like that you're not going to get a zombie lord without zombies in the deck, right? Every all of our decks check to make sure that they they pair correctly, so that there's at least some amount like a floor of synergies for the deck. Um, and we also have the intrinsic element that are, you know, because you can combine half decks, right, you do have a little bit more ability to find the perfect match and really pair things up. And so being able to find synergies for your decks is is kind of built into the to the game engine to some degree. Um, and then we have a, uh, a variety of tools that are we're, we're working on for how uh, these things can be balanced in organized play. Um, one of the ideas that we uh, we are working with um, is that decks, as they win tournaments, will actually uh, level up themselves. They'll gain different tiers, so they go from you know bronze to silver to gold. And that a higher level deck will actually get you admission into higher level tournaments, um, but also will mean that your you know your your level three gold deck is not going to be playable at the local store level anymore because it's been leveled up uh, through. So there's a way to like advanced decks as they move through the through the queues is both a positive thing and uh and a way to make sure that the the, the local tournament scene keeps fresh and interesting um and we spent a lot of time you know really developing each of the the cards and making sure that everything is within a reasonable power band right one of the things that the keyforge engine uh really made it so that you could have a pretty wide range of power levels on each card because you would draw a hand and you could just choose to play the entire faction of cards so even if you had a, some not as good cards building up you could play them all at once soulforge you really have to make every decision meaningful for each of the five cards that are in your hand because you're only going to play two of them and so while some of them we can make very niche right things that like are good in specific circumstances uh, we want to make sure that you have meaningful choices each time and so we were very conscious of making sure that there's a reasonable power band um, across the different levels for each of the cards, so it's something we've put a lot of a lot of thought into. And again, I'm like, I feel like I'm like way glossing things over because it's too fast. So I just yeah. want to, I'm gonna punt, I'm gonna kick it over to Richard because there's too much there's too much to say here. So we can only just cover this at a high level. Yeah, uh, the the comment about uh, uh, Keyforge originally uh, not uh, working the same uh, about you know getting zombie lords and no zombies, for example. Um, Keyforge, uh, uh, I definitely aired 
at first on the side of variety. It's this this variety versus character thing again, where I wanted to include, uh, you know, cards which didn't have as many hooks as they should for the different combos within. And uh, and then, you know, pretty quickly I learned that uh, that you really wanted to uh, um, uh, sacrifice some of your variety to give your cat decks a, a interesting character. Um, there is uh, and uh, as as Justin said, with uh, Soulforge, uh, there is a need for the cards on a on a on, on a card to card basis to be more balanced than there was uh, in 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 Keyforge, uh, and and so there's been a lot more attention paid to that. Um, uh, it, you know, certainly. Uh, with Keyforge, it's it's a uh, uh, certainly yeah I there are some cards that are, there are very few examples of this you line up is strictly better I don't like to dominate there are some but not not much uh, um, but there are some that you look at and you say you know they're better even if they don't dominate and uh, um, and and there's a lot of reasons why that can work there that sort of approach doesn't you know sort of sloppy approach doesn't work as well with a game like Soulforge. Yeah, I, I I also saw a question. Uh, I want to again and again, like I said, there's there is a more than an hour already specific question. Um, so please do check check that stuff out on the podcast and the article. Um, but I also saw a question in the chat that kind of I want to you know tangent to while we still have a few minutes, which is like this idea of creating character versus uh, for each faction versus cross faction synergies with the half decks. Um, cause I think that's also really interesting and something we put a lot of thought into, right? We wanted each faction to have its own kind of inner faction synergies and inner faction feeling, but we also wanted to make sure that you had good reasons to pair any faction with any other faction and that you could actually see some, even though Necrium, for example, has all, you know, has tons of zombies, every other faction has at least one zombified creature that you could kind of want to pair with and make things happen. And so we put a lot of different thought into, into that balance. So I don't know if you have anything you want to say on that idea of how do you design good character factions that still have great synergies across. Yeah, yeah you still have that. You, you have that issue in Keyforge as well, like all the houses uh, in Keyforge. Um, uh, I put a, a lot of effort into making sure that uh, um, there was this. You, if you had this particular house matched with that particular house, they had an overlap of characters and things like that uh, in in uh soulforge uh um since you get to choose your house it's very exciting or choose your other faction it makes it very exciting to look for hooks into your combos in uh, in the two halves and so it, it has a little bit more uh, um, uh, 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 interest on that level it should be uh pointed out also that the the that uh, um the the houses slash faction slash colors in a sealed deck game you don't have to focus them as much as you do in a game like magic um and uh and and in magic i think i think it'll be a sign of jumping the shark if they ever do a a, a a sixth color it just doesn't make sense for a game like magic but with keyforge uh you can keep on coming out with new houses and uh, uh um and that's because the uh uh the character of the house isn't defined by the best cards which people can go out and get. It's defined by the whole structure of the rarities and everything else. Uh, you can have a little bit of, uh, of sort of uh, uh, direct damage, for example, in a color, and it doesn't make it a direct damage color. In Magic, it would, uh, yep. uh, because people could just play those cards. Yep. Uh, and so, and so, uh, what you aim for in your house, in your uh, faction design, is 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 really different, and yeah. uh, and it does open the door to potentially coming out with, uh, you know, even more factions later uh, yeah. without jumping the shark. Yeah, I remember that that the day that we really early on in the process when you kind of shared that you know that perspective and really explained your thoughts from Keyforge about how color pie is different, and obviously we all come from a magic original magic background uh, that brought us all into this uh, this great world um, and we had it in our minds that color pies work this certain way and it just it was another one of those moments of we just and I ran back to the team we were like all right everybody everything that you understand and thought about color pies is gone <laughs> we, we, yeah. we have to rethink yeah. this whole thing and really I mean, it's not like we shook up everything entirely because you do want to have that kind of core to each 
each faction, no. but like little bits and little this little twists on on different kind of elements in the in the in the game engine was just like uh, it was really fun to kind of shake that up and really think about it from that new perspective. So that's one of my fa- that's another one of my favorite stories it's, from how we've done things here. Yeah, it's really liberating in design because uh, you think of uh, like uh, designing uh, like your color pies being a character villain or a hero or something like that uh and but but like in a world of magic that hero this hero the red hero is really good at range damage it can never ever ever do anything to counterspell anything Mm -hmm. and that you know is like being able to design these things with sort of nuance and character is 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 quite different to somebody who's uh you know knows what they're doing in this space it's uh it feels it feels uh, wonderful like you can get so much more character out of the out of the factions slash houses slash colors yeah yeah it's it's been awesome and and again please for anybody that finds this part of the conversation interesting check out the podcast think like games on our podcast i just did with richard the most recent one. or go to justingary.com and read the latest article talks about all this stuff because i found it so fascinating like we yeah we spent hours talking about it and have you know it's just really upended the baselines of what i assumed would be the case for games there's just just nothing quite like this out there and so being able to take richard's lessons from keyforge and all of our collective lessons from both making and playing magic uh and and all the games that we've worked on even some elements of deck building from ascension as you're building your deck as you go and shuffling through your deck multiple times in soulforge all of those lessons have culminated here in soulforge fusion uh, and uh, it's been a real pleasure uh, to be here with you, Richard. And working on this has been honestly the the the, the dream of my career uh, to be able to work with you on this project and to be able to re bring it back to life. Uh, and so, for anybody out there that wants to be a part of it, uh, you could come and join the, the Kickstarter. We have one week left. Soulforge Fusion uh, on Kickstarter or Stoneblade.com forward slash Soulforge. You can also uh, just join our Discord, our Stoneblade Discord. Uh, if we haven't already yes. put a link in the chat, great. Um, because that you don't have to, you know, just you can play it for free on Tabletop Simulator right now. You can hang out and chat with us. You can tell us what you think. You can tell us what yep. you like, what you don't like. You could ask more questions there that we can answer that we didn't get time to here. Yes. Uh, you know, we really just want to grow this community. Um, you know, anything you could do to share it, to play the game, see if what you like, uh, let us know because it's one of the, the fun parts about this is not just being able to interact and sort of tell you what we think, but also hear what you think and, and improve the game. I mean, there are so many improvements that we have made just in the last month from people that have been in the Discord that have caught things that have helped us uh, to evolve uh, the way our rules are structured or certain keywords or certain elements. And so you really can have a real impact uh, on this process. Um, so so please do join us. Yeah, this has been great. And I just want to echo yeah, what you're just saying, Justin. Join the Discord. Fo- watch our future streams too, because there's so many cool questions in here that we'd, I'd love to spend the next two hours doing all this stuff, but you know, we're, we're running out of time here. We can only spend so much time doing this Q and a stuff, but we have more streams. We have the discord, bring the questions there. We'd love to discuss this kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, just, uh, just wanted to just echo that. And then just to say, you know, thank you, Richard. This has been, yeah, just a fun, fun hour here, fun hour plus at this point. Um, yeah, thank just, uh, we really appreciate you, uh, coming on the stream with us and, and hanging out for a bit. Uh, it's a pleasure. As I said, always fun talking games. Yeah. Very, very engaging. Yeah. Now I need another cup of coffee. Yes. Yeah, All right. I support <laughs> that. All right. We're off to get some coffee. Thank all you guys right. for yep. joining us. We're going to sign off. <laughs> See you all later. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.